Today, Pastor Javen concludes our series entitled, Who is the Holy Spirit? Where we will see that the Holy Spirit wants to fill our life on a regular basis. So take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5, just a few verses and then you can be seated. Start at verse 15. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a miracle, Holy Spirit, that I just read that without my reading glasses. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. God, we don't have to pray for your word to be anointed. Your word is already anointed. So God, I pray today that you would soften our hearts to receive your word. Anoint my mouth, my lips to, to, to share your word. But God, I pray today that you would help us to receive what you have spoken to us through your word. Enlighten our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds to understand your word today, God. Help us as we journey this life following you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a good day. And again, I am so glad that you are here and that you are with us. And and I believe that God's going to speak into our life today. I'm excited about what he's going to say. Uh, has anybody ever told you that you were full of it? Yeah. They don't always mean that as a compliment, do they? So, you know, they tell you you're full of it. You're full of nonsense. You're full of craziness. You're full of hogwash. You're full of rubbish. Whatever you want to think of. Believe it or not, I've been told before that I'm full of it. Um, I like to think, though, when they told me I was full of it, that they meant it in a good way. They meant, Javen, you are full of it. You're full of wisdom. <clears throat> you're full of understanding. You're full of humor. You're full of clarity. You're full of all the good things, right? That's how we look at it. That's how we want to look at it. Several weeks back in our previous series, I made the comment that that we can be full of a lot of things in our life, right? We can be full of the things that I just mentioned. We can be full of jealousy. We can be full of envy. We can be full of rage and anger. We can be full of bitterness. But Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, has made a way for us to be full of his Holy Spirit. And that's what he encourages us to be. And when we're full of the spirit of God, we're full with the the qualities, the abilities, the giftings we need to to live this life with him, to live this life for him, to allow him to live this life through us, to call people to the kingdom of God. And when we read this passage of scripture that we read in Ephesians chapter five, that's what Paul is doing. He is exhorting and encouraging his listeners to constantly be filled with the Spirit of God. And today as we conclude our series on who is the Holy Spirit, this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at what is what does it mean? What is this talking about being filled with the Spirit of God? Over these last couple of weeks, we've talked about who the Holy Spirit is. And we talked about how Jesus said that it was good that he was going to leave so that the Father could send the Holy Spirit to be with us in this life. And so we said, who is he? And, and, and the Holy Spirit is more, he's not just a third wheel. He's not just someone that comes alongside us and he's along with us so that we don't have to be alone. That is an an unbelievable characteristic and aspect of the Holy Spirit that we should treasure, that we should value, that the Holy Spirit is with us, that he wants to be with us. He is our peace that passes understanding. He is our comfort. He is our guide. He is our ever-present help in a time of trouble. He is with us at all times. But there's so much more to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third part of the Godhead. He is deity. To treat him as anything less as God and to having the power of God and that that power working within us is wrong. And so we understand and we have seen that the Holy Spirit, he is hovering over our life. Just like we sang and just like we've seen from the, from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit is hovering. He is, he, is, he is moving over our emptiness and wants to fill it. He's moving over our darkness and wants to bring light. He's moving over our chaos and wants to bring order. Going back to the series that we did before this one, we talked about the Holy Spirit empowers us to be the witnesses of God that he's called us to be, to grow the kingdom of God. And we saw last week that the Holy Spirit empowers us and lives through us to live a victorious life 
over sin. That we don't have to live this life as victims to the nature of sin that we battle on a daily basis in our life. Right? It is a daily battle. But we don't, we, when we fight this battle, we fight this battle from a place of victory already. We don't have to live as victims to that. We don't have to live with a mentality that says, don't sin today, don't sin today, don't sin today. We live with a mentality that says, I am a child of God. And we focus on our relationship with the Heavenly Father that we have because of Jesus Christ, because of what he did on the cross, that we have through the connection of the Holy Spirit. And the more we live in that relationship, drawing closer to God through his Spirit, the more victoriously we live in this life. So the Spirit of God is empowering us. The Spirit of God is hovering over us. The Spirit of God is convicting us of the things that we don't need in our life. But the Spirit of God is also contending for us and interceding for us. And the Spirit of God is liberating us. And the Spirit of God is leading us. And the Spirit of God wants to continually fill us. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we include this. As Eddie mentioned, if you didn't know, today is Pentecost Sunday. What is Pentecost Sunday? For some of you, you think Pentecost, that you think a, a denomination. You think a way that a, when you look around here and you watch people worship, you think, oh, yep, they're the Pentecostals, right? Because you watch them, they got their hands up, they got a little bounce in the way they, you know. They're the Pentecostals. They're, they're, well, Pentecost, going all the way back into Jewish culture and Jewish history, Pentecost was a one of several feasts that were very important and festivals that were very important to the Jewish history and the Jewish community. There, there's about seven of them, but there are four that, including Pentecost, three others that lead up to Pentecost, I want to I wanna remind us of today. Now these, these feasts, these festivals, these were not optional to the Jewish community. It didn't matter where they were scattered to. It didn't matter where they were, where they had dispersed to. Uh, it, it, when those times of feast came, they gathered back to Jerusalem to celebrate in these feasts. The first was one called Passover. Maybe you've heard of that. You've, you've seen that mentioned in Scripture. You've heard that talked about. The, the Passover was a time that they remembered the last plague of Egypt that allowed them to be freed from the bondage of sin, uh, the bondage of slavery that they were in in Egypt, that the Israelites were in in Egypt. See, that last plague, Jesus had told, or God had told the, the Israelite community to sacrifice a spotless lamb, to put the blood of that lamb over their doorposts, and when they did, that the death angel would pass over their homes and they would not be affected by death. And so what happened is they were freed that night. That was the last play that caused Pharaoh to say, get out, you can go, leave this place. And they were freed from the bondage of slavery that they were in under Egypt. And they were, they were freed from the death that passed over their home that night. Passover would traditionally start on the 14th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar. All right? Now, the very next day, the 15th day of that first month of the Jewish calendar, the very next day started what was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This was a seven-day festival, a seven-day feast, but it started on that very next day after Passover. And this was a seven-day feast where they where they remembered the escape from Egypt, the journey that began from Egypt, and they remembered the provision of bread that God gave them during that time. Now, leaven is, is what caused bread to rise, and the bread that God provided for them was a different kind of bread. They called it manna. They just, it was different than anything that they had known. But all throughout Scripture, bread or leaven is symbolic of sin, okay? So we go from Passover. We go to the next day begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the next day after that, the third day begins the Feast of First Fruits, this was when they would sacrifice the first part of their harvest, their flocks, their earnings to God in recognition again of the provision that he made for them. And so the feast, the Passover began on the 14th, the feast of unleavened bread started the day after that. And then on the third day was the feast of the first fruits. Then you would come to the feast of weeks or what is known as Pentecost. Pentecost literally means 50, all right? So Pentecost was seven weeks and one day after Passover. And this feast was a time where they celebrated and, and they, it, the harvest and they offered thanksgiving for the harvest, the wheat grain that God had provided for them and for their families and that they had received. 
Again, there's other feasts that take place beyond these, but these are the four that kind of, and with P, uh, Pentecost, the three others, these kind of all relate together in this time. Now, just like with everything else, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus gave new meaning to these feasts and to these festivals. On Passover, Jesus Christ became the spotless lamb of God that was sacrificed for the sins of all of humanity. On Passover, the sacrificial lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God, gave his life so that we could be freed from the slavery of sin that we are in bondage of, like we talked about last week, and we are freed from death because we have life in him. That's what Jesus did on Passover. Jesus often called himself, he called himself the bread of life. And he was, he lived a sinless life. So unleavened bread prophetic, prophetically symbolized the sinless life of Jesus Christ. And on that day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it began, Jesus' body was in the tomb at the beginning of this feast, but it's through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are given a way to be raised to new life in Christ. Then, on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And Paul calls him the first of a great harvest of all who died. He was the first fruits of the dead who after that time then went around and began to prove his resurrection to all of those who were his followers, to the witnesses. And he explained to them how everything that was talked about in scriptures that they read in the Jewish scrolls was fulfilled in him that it happened through him. And then he began to explain to them what was next for the expansion of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so he does that over these next 37 or so days. And then, and then he tells the disciples, you need to go pray. And he ascends into heaven. So the next 10 days, the disciples and all those around, the followers of Christ begin to spend time praying and seeking God. And then on the day of Pentecost, the infilling of the Holy Spirit came upon the followers of God who were waiting to receive that promise. And on that day, 3,000 people repented of their sins, turned their life to Jesus Christ, began to follow him, were baptized in him, and they began to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought on that day an incredible day of harvest. And what the Holy Spirit was doing was empowering the body of Christ, the followers of Christ, to begin to reach the harvest that Jesus said was plentiful, but the workers were few. Now it didn't matter. The, if, if, even if the workers are few, they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is greater than anything that exists in this world. So we have the power of the Spirit of God to reach the harvest that he says is plentiful. See, the people were not just receiving now a law that says this is how you relate to God and this is how you relate to other people. Now they were receiving what the prophet Ezekiel said, a spirit from God that takes away our stubborn hearts and softens our hearts and makes them responsive to God to follow God and live with God the way that he wants us to live. So at the day of Pentecost, Jesus poured his spirit out onto all flesh. And when this happened, Luke tells us in his writing in Acts chapter two that Peter got up on that day and he began to speak to the people there, to his fellow Jews. And he made this statement and he said these words and he referenced the prophet Joel. And he reminded them of what Joel said, that in the last days, now again, I said this the other week, and when they used that phrase, in the last days, that was a reference in the Jewish community to the coming of the Messiah. When the Messiah would come, that was the last day because they believed when the Messiah come, again, he would, he would take control, he would reign, he would conquer everybody that was against them. But Jesus was the Messiah, and the Messiah was just doing things differently than what they had expected to be done. And so Peter was saying the Messiah had come. You just didn't want to receive him as the Messiah, but the Messiah has come. And so he reminds them, Joel's words, in the last days, God said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh, on all people. He said he would pour out his spirit on the young and the old. He would pour out his spirit on men and on women. And he would begin to speak through and work through everyone who his spirit was poured out on. And so Peter is saying, look, it's begun. 
Because the Messiah has come and now he is pouring his spirit out onto all people. And so that day has come. And then we see him say, and see this happen in Acts uh, chapter two, verses 37 and 39. Peter's words pierced the hearts of those listening. And they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what do we need to do? In other words, they knew there was a response that needed to take place in their life to what Jesus had done for them. And so Peter replied to him, he said, each one of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Quick clarification on this. It's not because we often say there's, there's all this debate. Well, do you baptize in the name of Jesus? Do you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Jesus said to baptize others in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter's saying baptize them in the name of Jesus. What Peter is saying is he's reminding them there is no other way by which you must be saved than through Jesus Christ. So he's saying every other way. So all of your traditions that you think bring you to God, those traditions are not bringing you to God. It's only through Jesus Christ. So you need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Turn, repent from all of your sinful ways. Turn to what Jesus Christ has done for you and allow yourself now to be baptized in what he's done for you. And then, then you receive the forgiveness of your sins. And then he says this, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, there's a differentiation. Notice we'll, we'll talk about that more in a second. He says, the promise is to you. Notice who it says. He says, so it's to those who are present. That promise is for you. Then he says, it's to your children. So in other words, that promise is generational. It's passed down. Then he says, it's to those far away. In other words, there is no partiality by which the Holy Spirit gives himself to. No matter where you come from, no matter where you have your background, no matter where you've lived, the Holy Spirit is for you. It is for all who have been called by the Lord God, who received Jesus Christ and what he has done in their life. So moving forward in the early church, what we see is these three different experiences begin to take place in people's lives. You have a salvation experience, and it's these three different baptisms that happen. You have the salvation experience. And upon your salvation experience, believing in Jesus Christ, believing in who he is, believing in what he's done for your life through his death and through his resurrection, you accept him as your salvation. You become a follower of Christ. You are saved and you're united with the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. So there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that immerses you into relationship with the Father through what Jesus did by the Spirit. And that and that. Baptism of the Holy Spirit immerses you into the body of Christ. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, where Paul says that you've not been given a spirit of fear, but you've been given a spirit of sonship, a spirit within you that cries, Abba, Father, a spirit that is within you that unites you as a child to your heavenly Father, to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 12, verse 13, he writes this. He says, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. That was the way of the working in that day. He says, but we have all been baptized in one body by one spirit. So again, we're all united together in one body through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, he says this, Now all of us can come to the Father through the Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. We are baptized. In the whole, of, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that immerses us into relationship with the Heavenly Father and in relationship with the body of Christ. And then we symbolize the salvation experience that we have in Christ through what we call water baptism. A baptism literally meaning immersion, where, we, where, where you go into water symbolically showing that you have washed yourself, you've been washed and cleansed from sin by the power of the Holy Spirit and from, from the penalty of it through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that takes place when one disciple baptizes a new disciple who is beginning to follow Christ. Right, And so this, and it shows the connection that that believer now has with the heavenly father and their commitment to him and their commitment to be a disciple of Christ. This is what Jesus talks about in his commission to go to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And thankfully today, we're going to have baptisms after both services, which is awesome. And then there's this third experience <clears throat> that scripture seems to talk about. And it's called a baptism in the Holy Spirit is what it's been called. And I want to just show you that briefly in the scripture of being filled with the spirit 
John the Baptist, the same John the Baptizer who said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? Which is what happened through his death and resurrection during the time of Passover. He said this in Matthew chapter three, verse 11. He says, I, John the Baptist says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to follow God, okay? But he says this, someone is coming soon who's greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not worthy even to be a slave and carry his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of those gospel writers referenced John the baptizer talking about Jesus and bringing that baptism. And this is what we see begin to happen through the books of, book of Acts and through the early church. I want you to go with me to a part of uh, Paul's missionary journey, one of these experiences where it's taking place. This is when Paul is leaving the uh, uh, area of Corinth where they had just begun to establish a church and he's traveling to Ephesus. This is before any of the letter, before the letter we read to open our service, before, uh, or the, before, to open the message, before he writes the letters to the church in Corinth. This is all happening before that. But Acts chapter 19, start at verse 1, he says, While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. And he asked them, he said, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they replied, We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked, and they replied, The baptism of John. So in other words, they realized there's something in my life that I need to repent of and turn to God that's not right. So they repented and, and, and John's challenge and they turned to God, all right? And so he says, they replied, the baptism of John. Peter said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. That's referencing the verse that we just read. And as soon as they heard this, now they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. All right, and he says there were about 12 men in all. Now, notice within this a differentiation between a salvation experience and a repentance and a receiving of the Holy Spirit. And the question that Paul asked in verse 2 is a very important question. He said, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Now, for them, they knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. They didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. They had never heard of the Holy Spirit. For us, we know about the Holy Spirit. Most of us, we've heard about the Holy Spirit. Hopefully, if you've been here the last several weeks or you've listened or watched online, you've heard us talk about who the Holy Spirit is. So we don't necessarily, it's not that we don't necessarily heard the Holy Spirit. So a way that we can ask that question today is, is, have we fully been receptive to the Holy Spirit? And I can't talk about the Holy Spirit without addressing what we see happen in this passage because what we see happen in this passage is what causes so many to be unreceptive to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And that's the, that's the, the, the fact that these guys began to speak in tongues. And this is what we see happen often through the book of Acts in the early church. When people received the Holy Spirit, it says that they began to speak in tongues. When Peter went to a Gentile's house, Cornelius, and he talked to him about Jesus and his life was changed, he received the salvation experience of Jesus. And then all of a sudden he received the Holy Spirit and he and his family began to speak in tongues. The common thought and, and thing that you hear a lot today is, is that if, if this happens, then people are afraid that they're activating a demon more than they are activating their faith. I want to encourage you by some of, of a couple of things, all right? Luke chapter 11, Luke writes these words, verses 11, we go here. He says, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? He said, if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. Now those gifts sound crazy to us, different time. He says, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them? In other words, if you are asking God for the promise of his Holy Spirit and for him to give you the Holy Spirit, what he gives you is going to be a good gift. You are not receiving anything, uh, receiving anything from God than that which, other than that which is good from him, and that is the Holy Spirit. Now, let me encourage you again. Paul did not ask these people when he came to them. He didn't say, did you speak in tongues? He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Now, by effect, when they received the Holy Spirit in this moment, they spoke in tongues. 
But I want to tell you, this is my belief. Speaking in tongues does not make someone a greater Christian than someone who doesn't speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues does not make someone more holy than someone who doesn't speak in tongues. But I also want to encourage us to not allow the misunderstanding of tongues and praying in in the Spirit to cause us to be unreceptive to the fullness of the Spirit in our life. And I want to show you through the Scripture just a couple of quick verses what Paul says that where he shows us it benefits us as a believer and in our personal life. In the very next chapter of Ephesians, chapter 6, where we, we, we read Ephesians 5, you go to that next chapter, he's talking about how our battle is spiritual. There's some battles that are beyond us, like we sang about this morning. And when he gets to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says to pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And many will say that that just means that you're praying in unison with the Father. And I agree with that. We do want to pray in unison with the Father, connected to the Father, believing in what the Father says. But I don't think we can limit it to just that because I want to cross-reference it with a couple of things from Paul in his letter to 1 Corinthians. Because see, we can use the Bible as its own commentary. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he says this, No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. So in other words, the spirit of God knows the heart and the thoughts and the mind of the Father in a way that we don't. Right? Now we jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says this. Paul is talking about tongues, he's talking about prophecy in the church, and he says, if I pray in tongues, what's praying? My spirit is praying. He says, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Then he says this, well, then what shall we do? He said, well, I'll pray in the spirit. Same phrase as what he puts in Ephesians chapter six, verse 18. And he says, but I will also pray in words I understand. So what is Paul doing? He is differentiating the fact that praying in the spirit may mean sometimes we pray in ways we don't, the Holy Spirit is praying through us. And he says, I will sing in the spirit but I will also sing in words that I understand, right? So Paul is showing that there is a benefit in being open to receiving that aspect of the Holy Spirit because when, if you pray in the Spirit, you're praying the mind of the Father, Paul is saying. But let's keep going in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying. You'll be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues, Paul says, more than any of you. But in a church meeting, he said, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. In other words, he's saying that when we are together as a body of Christ, the goal is to edify one another. And we can't edify one another when we don't understand one another. So he goes on to say, don't forbid tongues. But when we're together as a body, the goal is to edify one another. And the spirit praying through you is to, ed- is to help you. So now some will say, and, and there's the argument, well, Paul says that this will cease and this will come to a stop. Just real quick, I want to point this out. That, that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when he makes that statement. That, that, and that happens on the day of perfection is what he says when perfection comes. We're not perfected until we are in the presence of Christ and receive our new bodies. So we look at the context of the whole of that letter. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit. We're baptized into one body, into one Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit come, they work through us, they operate us within that body. He goes into 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and it reminds him, it doesn't matter how much you want to operate in those gifts, if you don't operate with the Spirit of love, you're not operating in God. Because Jesus called you to love and to love everybody. So there's been a lot of people that have proclaimed the name of God, proclaimed the name of Jesus, proclaimed they operate in the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit and turn around and cuss and rebuke and, 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 and do mean things to people throughout the week. That's not the Holy Spirit. You're to operate in the gift of love and in the, in, with love. And within that context, then he says that there's a day when they will come into the day of perfection when all that does, we don't need those things anymore. Then he goes into 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and he goes into more depth about tongues and prophecy. Then he goes into 1 Corinthians 15 and he talks about that day of resurrection when we come to meet Christ. That's the context of that whole. That's why I believe 
that the fullness of the Spirit still exists and wants to operate in people's lives. We cannot take the aspects of the Holy Spirit we like and do away with the aspects of the Holy Spirit that are hard for us to understand. Right? So bottom line, don't allow not understanding that aspect of praying in the Spirit keep you from being open to say, God, I just want to receive your spirit, the fullness of your spirit, however you want to give me the spirit, however you want to pour your spirit in me, however you want to work through me in your spirit, however you want to fill me with your spirit, God, I'm open to your spirit being in me. Because when the church did that, God's presence became alive in them. The mission became personal to them and the power of God began to work through them. Right? And that's what we want in our life. Now, I haven't even talked about Ephesians chapter 5. And some of you are looking at the clock and you're like, we're an hour in. All right. So real quick to wrap this up. We get in this moment of Ephesians 5 and Paul's reminding them of what happened in Acts 19 when they received the Holy Spirit. And he tells them, he says, look, he says, you need to continually be receptive to the Spirit. When you look at the Greek language, Greek scholars tell us the way that's written, the forms in which it's written, command form. It's written in a command form. It's written in a uh, imperative form. It's written in a passive voice. It's written in a, uh, a present tense, which means that it's not a suggestion. He's saying, you need to do this. You need to open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. You need to receive the Holy Spirit, meaning wait and receive, just like the, the, the first uh, disciples did. And you need to continually allow the Spirit to fill you in your life. Acts 2 was not the only time that the Holy Spirit filled the believers. So our, our having been filled is no substitute for our need to continually be full of the Holy Spirit. And then real quick, right before he gets to that phrase where he says, be filled with the Spirit, he gives them a few warnings. Verse 15, he's basically warning them, you need to be aware of what's constantly happening in you and what, where you're constantly putting yourself in this life because what you surround yourself with in this life will shape you. We talked about this, John chapter 17, Jesus basically prayed, God, they're in the world, but don't let them be shaped by the world. Let your Holy Spirit shape them. So he's saying we need to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the presence of God and in the Holy Spirit to allow the Holy Spirit to shape our life. It's not about taking away fun and joy and fulfillment in our life. It's about taking away the things in our life that we think bring us life, but are actually killing us. So surround yourself in a way that you know what's shaping you. Then in verse 16, he's basically telling them, redeem your time, capture every opportunity. The days are evil. Another way of saying that is that there's a lot of cares. There's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of pain in these days. So see the opportunity in the pain. Instead of seeing the problem in front of you, pray for God to reveal to you the potential for his power to work through that problem. And then he goes into verse 17, he's saying, replace the will of God, or he said, be be careful that you're not replacing the will of God with your will. Know the will of God. How do we know the will of God? It goes back, we talked about it last week, we referenced Romans chapter 12. The more you spend time with the presence of God, seeking his spirit, he will transform your mind. He will renew your mind. And Paul says, when you renew your mind, then then you know the will of God, the good and pleasing will of God. So if you're walking in the spirit of God, if you are genuinely wanting to walk in the presence and the spirit of God and just trying to follow him, trying to obey him, don't put so much pressure on yourself with whether or not you're in the will of God. If you're trusting him and you're following him, you're in his will. He can take the decision you make here and the decision you make there either way and use it for his good purposes. If you are genuinely following God, Then in verse 18, he uses wine. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but basically he's saying, we'll use wine to stimulate us, but wine will dissipate. It doesn't last. And that can be substituted with anything that we use in this life to try to stimulate us in a moment. Paul is saying, nothing in this life is gonna stimulate your life the way that the Holy Spirit is gonna do it. So you need to be open to being filled with, with the Spirit. And then he says the way you're constantly filled with the Spirit is to open yourself to his presence, worshiping, singing, praising him, worshiping in your life and worshiping with the body, singing, singing in his presence.
praising him. So who is the Holy Spirit? Hopefully you see the Holy Spirit is hovering over your life. He is moving over your life. He is convicting you of the things that need to be convicted, but he's contending for you with the Heavenly Father. He wants to liberate you. He wants to lead you. And he wants to empower you by his spirit for the glory of God. So let our prayer be, Holy Spirit, fill my life. Come, Holy Spirit. The goal is not just to have an experience in a service. That can happen. I'm not saying that doesn't happen and can't happen. But the goal is to be filled with the Spirit so that when we go out there, every time they were filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts, it wasn't about a building in a church service. It was about what happened in the streets, in the marketplace, through the power of the Spirit working in their life. So it's about being open and saying, Spirit, I want you to work in me and make an impact through me. Just this closing example. It's like a sponge. And what you use to clean clean with with that sponge. You know, when you open a, a sponge and you take a sponge out of the case and you just use that sponge without dipping it into some type of cleansing solution, you might can do something, but it's not going to be extremely effective, right? And oftentimes the sponge is, is hard. There's hardness to it. But when that sponge is, is dipped into the whatever cleaning solution it needs to be dipped into, then the hardness is gone. And it becomes pliable. And it becomes useful to be able to effectively clean what it needs to clean and do what it needs to do. We, by the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God comes into our life, we become pliable. We become useful for His good purposes. He softens our hard heart. And He breaks us down for Him and for His purposes. But it's one thing for the sponge to be immersed in and to be in that solution. It's another thing for that solution to be in that sponge. Because if the sponge just stays in and doesn't come out and use what's been put in it, it's not gonna be effective. What's in the sponge comes out to what it's used on. When we are filled by the Spirit of God, His Spirit comes in us and then we go out and that Spirit pours out of us into others that spirit works through us we constantly feel God fill me with your spirit so that I can go out and be used by you God fill me with your spirit so that I can go out and be used by you God fill me with your spirit so that I can go out and be used by you and the way God works in you the way God uses you is in so many ways He has given you an opportunity through your job, through your career, that the Holy Spirit can work through you. I encourage you to be here next week because you're going to hear more about that. He works through you in so many different ways. But God, let us be open to you and to your spirit, to being filled by you and what you want to do in our lives. Stand with me. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find the link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.